I hate deciding what anime to watch sometimes. There are so many good shows airing this season and so many classics in my backlog that I honestly get overwhelmed trying to pick one to just sit down and finish. I want to watch more anime and find new stuff that interests me, but with all these options to choose from, it might be easier to just pick something at random. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. A while back, I created a website that can randomly pick from every single entry on my anime list, and I have been forcing myself to watch whatever it gives me in its entirety for your viewing pleasure. The results so far have been mixed to say the least. But hey, at least I'm watching more anime. But before we begin, this video is brought to you by Manscaped, the men's lifestyle brand looking to transform the way you think about grooming. Manscaped currently helps over 9 million men worldwide maintain their confidence and their shave. And they just recently introduced the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring the brand new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra electric trimmer. This trimmer brings things to the next level with its dual skin safe blade heads. You've got the upgraded trimmer blade featuring longer, wider, rounded teeth that cut through hair with ease. Then the foil blade is designed to glide across skin, leaving it perfectly smooth. And just look how easy it is to switch between the two to get the perfect trim every time. The Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra also has a bigger LED light with a new dual temperature feature for multiple skin tones. It has a rechargeable lithium ion battery, a travel lock, USB-C charging, and of course, it's still waterproof. Along with the main course, the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra also comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and Nose Trimmer, which is also waterproof, cordless, rechargeable, and built with skin-safe technology. You also get the Crop Soother and Crop Preserver Aftershave Lotion and Deodorant, designed to keep everything feeling fresh and smelling nice. And on top of all that, when you purchase the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you'll get the Boxers 2.0 and Shed 2.0 for free. One to store your treasure, the other to store the family jewels. So join the 9 million men worldwide that put their confidence in Manscaped and get yourself the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra today. When you use my promo code Lextorious, you'll get 20% off, free international shipping, and two free gifts. That's 20% off, plus free shipping, and two free gifts with promo code Lextorious at Manscaped.com. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring the video. So we are now four episodes into this series, and as fun as torturing myself for no reason has been, I think I need to spice things up. I think I need some sort of goal, something to work towards when I'm spinning the wheel. And I have just the idea on what to do. So what you are looking at right now is a bingo card that I have made, that I'm going to be trying to get a bingo on using only anime from my anime randomizer. And essentially the rules of the game are that I'm going to be trying to get a bingo using this, Every anime that I spin using my randomizer will fill out exactly one space on this bingo card, provided that I finish it. If I don't finish the anime, I can't use it to fill out a space on this, and as well, if an anime accounts for multiple spaces that it could be used for, I can only pick one to fill out. As you can probably deduce by now, that means I'm going to be watching at least five anime, probably more before I get a bingo. I've tried to make every space as general and broad as possible so that I can fill them out as quickly as I can and hopefully not have to watch too many anime, but I also haven't tested this or tried it out before, so I have literally no idea how it's gonna go. So with all that out of the way, let's get to spinning the wheel. All right, spin number one, let's go. What are we gonna get? It's been so long. Wasare Boshi. Okay. So our first anime, Wasare Boshi, isn't an anime, I think. I mean, the definitions of what is or isn't anime is up for a lot of debate right now, but a five minute watercolor animation a la the Take On Me music video might be kind of a stretch. How long must this have taken to make if it's entirely watercolor? You have to watercolor every frame? Don't get me wrong though, it is surprisingly good. The whole thing is basically just the fever dream of this girl who narrates herself going through a bunch of weird, trippy sequences that Wikipedia tells me are all supposed to relate to conception or having kids. The plot is honestly a bit nonsensical, but it's super fun and the animation for it is cool and unique looking, so I enjoyed myself. Dude, this is actually sick. This is actually kind of cool. What the heck? The x-ray laser that can see the tiniest thing in the world. Picoscope. Was that an advertisement? <laughs> Was that an advertisement for a microscope? What the fuck? 
However, the lore behind Wasori Boshi is kind of wild because it was originally created as a promotional video for the SP Ring 8 Angstrom Compact Free Electron Laser, or SACLA for short, which is an X-ray laser thing built in Japan that I guess is a really big innovation for microbiology and surgery and stuff. No idea why this video was made as a promotion for that or what an X-ray laser has to do with an art house film about conception, but the short itself is pretty good, so I'm giving it a should watch. And I'm using it to check off the under 10 minutes space on the bingo card. Uh, let's see what we get next. Hopefully something good. Oh my, oh my god, Mao Senso. Uh, Magical Warfare. God damn, this is a very popular show, um, comparatively. Anime numero two is Maho Senso, or Magical Warfare. Right off the bat, I use this to check off the magic space on the bingo card, because that just felt obvious to me. However, this would prove to be a mistake, because this anime was actually made by Madhouse in 2014, meaning it would have easily qualified for the famous studio space, giving me three in a row. But alas, I didn't think to do that. The anime is based... The anime is based off of a light novel written by Hisashi Suzuki in 2011, and is firmly in the magical high school genre which makes it very unique as an anime based off a light novel about magic high school students has never been done before. <laughs> the series is directed by Yuzo Sato, and the adaptation was actually done as part of a group of light novel adaptations from the same publishing company, Media Factory. One of the other adaptations from that same group being No Game No Life, which started airing the week after Maho Senso finished. Now, I'm not gonna say that all of the resources at Madhouse were being put towards No Game No Life instead of this, that would be a completely baseless assumption, and I don't have enough knowledge about the anime industry to support it. So I'm just gonna heavily imply it. <laughs> now, the last show I watched from the genre, Honor Student at Magic High, caused me a lot of pain and boredom. <laughs> so I'm hoping that Maho Senso will maybe change my opinion on all that. Let's get into it. The first episode establishes our main character, Takeshi, as this regular high school kid with a regular high school girlfriend heading to his regular high school kendo club. On his way there, he finds a strange girl passed out on the floor, so he takes her to the school nurse. And when she wakes up, uh, this happens. All right. I don't know what I expected. The girl, Mui, explains that she's a magician on the run from a group of evil magicians, and she might have accidentally awoken Takeshi's own magic powers when they first met. Funnily enough, not from the smooch, but rather this. Oh, fuck it. Could she pull out a gun? What the fuck? Yeah, so Mui decides to blow Takeshi away with a magic glock, but misses and ends up giving him a gios. Like, literally just a Gios. His eye glows and he can see into the future and everything. And he uses this power to fend off the attacking magicians and help Mui escape. Oh my god, that is the funniest looking CG, holy shit. <laughs> the two then run into Takeshi's girlfriend and best friend, who get caught up in the crossfire, and end up turning into magicians too. Which, uh... <laughs> the boob shake. <laughs> Oh my god, her power is that she can grow her boobs. I... I just don't know what I expected. Our newly awakened trio of magicians, alongside Mui, then fend off the bad guys and save the day. And after the fight, Mui invites everyone to a special school that can teach them how to control their newfound powers. And that is how Maho Senso begins. Right off the bat, I was pretty lukewarm on this show. I will say it is infinitely better than Honor Student at Magic High, just because this is a main story and not some weird spin-off thing. There's actual plot and characters and action and stuff. It's just, none of it ever really stuck out to me. Aside from the comedically egregious fan service, that is. The animation is all right. I definitely get the vibe this wasn't a production with a ton of time or money behind it. Again, it's just kind of whatever. It's not offensive, but... Eh. Though for whatever reason, the voice cast behind this is insane. Takeshi is actually played by Mamoru Miyano, aka Okarin, aka Light Yagami. Mui is also voiced by Sasuke, Takeshi's best friend is voiced by Kakashi, and later in the show we meet characters voiced by Bakugo, Major Kusanagi, Griffith, and Zoro. 
Heck, I made jokes about Code Geass. Lelouch's voice actor is in this show as a minor character. So there's at least one part of this production that's got some major juice behind it. Moving into the rest of the series, it does turn into a straightforward magic high school plot. Takeshi and his friends enroll in the school for magicians. They learn all about magic and how to use it though Takeshi's main ability is just to hit people with a sword for the most part. We then get more familiar with the bad guys, a group of magic supremacists called the Ghost Trailers, who want to take over the world and subjugate the non-magic users. I've gotta say, while the gang is pretty cool because their whole thing is like rewriting the memories of good guys to turn them into villains, the name Ghost Trailers is by far one of the worst I've ever heard. <laughs> and with that whole plot setup of the good guys versus the bad guys, the show's story kinda goes exactly where you'd expect it to. There is some interesting conflict and characters that get brought up in later episodes that I won't spoil. However, it's kinda all stunted by some really weird pacing issues, where it'll just spend an entire episode explaining lore and dumping exposition on you, and then the next episode will skip past a bunch of seemingly important events. I'm almost certain this is because it's a 12 episode show trying to adapt as much of the light novel story as it could, because it also leads to one of the worst parts of the entire production, which is that it ends on what is basically a cliffhanger. The series only adapted the first seven of 12 light novels, which is a lot, but not the full story. So it just kinda ends and doesn't resolve any of the major conflicts or arcs or anything. So despite some interesting aspects here and there, the highest rating I could really give this is a can watch. It's not bad, if you have nothing else to watch it is perfectly fine, but there's just not a lot that grabbed me and what did interest me just kinda fizzled out by the final episode. Which does mean that Maho Senso unfortunately did not break the curse of the magic high school genre being kinda mid. Though, the ED is by Nano and is an absolute banger, so there is that. Madhouse? What are you doing here? Was, wait, was this a Madhouse? I thought it was TBS. Third spin. Let's go. Hopefully something better. <laughs> Data Live Movie, Mayuri Judgment. <laughs> Why? Anime number three is Date Alive Movie, Mayuri Judgment, the first theatrical film in the rather massive Date Alive series. A series stemming from the original light novel written by Koshi Tachibana in 2011, which was then adapted into an anime starting in 2013 that currently has its fifth season coming out next year, with Mayuri Judgment having come out in 2015 in between seasons two and three. Now, the production of this show is strange. The director, Keitaro Matanaga, actually directed the entire series up until the third season, and was also responsible for stuff like School Days and Katanagatari of all things. However, the studios that have worked on this project are where things get really weird. Basically, the first season was picked up by AIC and licensed by Funimation, who most likely had plans to adapt the full series. However, AIC disbanded its entire production department in 2014 after getting bought out and sold to the current owner for only 8,000 yen, which is like 70 bucks. Production IMS then formed from former AIC staff who left the company, and took on season 2 and the movie. Though IMS themselves then filed for bankruptcy in 2018 after taking on massive amounts of debt. The third season was then picked up by JC staff in 2019, who thankfully didn't immediately implode like the others. However, with the Crunchyroll Funimation merger in 2022, the rights to the series shifted over, and the remaining two seasons and movies and stuff were all given to Geek Toys, with the director role being given to Jun Nakagawa. Needless to say, I think Data Live might be cursed. I think there's some form of a Harry Potter-esque curse on the franchise that makes sure that no studio can work on it for more than a single season. And speaking of cursed, let's get into the premise of the show. Which is... Well, it's not cursed, it's just really weird. The basic gist is that the story takes place in the real world, except cataclysmic earthquakes keep happening and killing people. The protagonist of the series, Shido, finds out these earthquakes are caused by these magical spirits from another dimension, who all happen to look like cute anime girls. And the only way to stop these earthquakes is to make the girls fall in love with him. That is actually the premise of the show. Shido has to build and manage a harem of cute magical girls in order to save the universe. Which of course leads to complications, not only because there's like evil groups of people that want to kill him and stuff, but also because he has to keep going on dates with these girls or the world ends. 
It's very dumb, very fantastical, and very, very popular. <laughs> and I now have to watch a movie that takes place two seasons into this story and try to understand what's happening. Wish me luck. That is stupid. I hate that I had this idea for a video series. The movie opens with a musical number. Just hazarding a guess, I'm assuming one of the spirit girls is an idol because there's this whole concert introduction with a giant crowd. Also, there's about a dozen girls alongside our main character already, so it's safe to assume he's pretty deep into building his harem. After the concert, the group then goes to a pool to relax, which goes about as well as you might expect. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. The fucking rack focus. Fuck. Yeah, this show is definitely marking the fan service space on the bingo board. The main plot then kicks off when Shido looks outside the next day to see a giant ominous bubble in the sky. Apparently nobody else can see it, but it's slowly getting bigger. And the spirit girls figure out that it's probably an amalgamation of all of their excess energy. So the way to stop it, naturally, is for Shido to release that energy by going on dates with them, <laughs> one by one. And that is the entire movie. <laughs> Shido has to go on dates with all of the girls in his harem to stop this energy bubble. And that's it. <laughs> I mean, there's a side thing about this new spirit girl that Shido keeps seeing called Mayuri, but that doesn't even pay off until nearly 50 minutes in, when the bubble pops and the heroes fight a biblically accurate angel. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I won't even spoil it any more than that. The movie is only 70 minutes long, by the way. I, I feel like that's important to point out. Being the bulk of the movie, the dates themselves are kind of fun. I have no context for any of the girls in this harem, but getting them all one-on-one -on -one does let you see some fun personalities. I especially like this one girl, Yoshino, because she has like a shy, timid demeanor, but then also a loudmouth talking hand puppet that speaks for her most of the time. That's fun. Most of the dates are just Shido and one of the girls cooking food or going out to eat or something, which lets them bond and kind of re-express their love for each other. It's basically just like when a married couple goes on a second honeymoon late in the marriage to try and rekindle the spark, except with anime girls and for the fate of the universe. <laughs> Some highlights of these dates include Yoshino's, where they just go play hide and seek and stuff at the park, Shido's date with the idol girl, then has him wear a disguise so people don't harass them in public, the disguise being Shiori, a cousin of the idol, who is just Shido in a dress. <laughs> oh my fucking god, dude. Fan service. Even if there wasn't an ounce of nudity in this movie, I would still be stamping that fan service space as hard as I could. Oh, and one of the dates with an emotionless twin character has her just take Shido to a love hotel where she proceeds to f I'm not kidding, that's actually what happens. Watch the movie yourself and see. And so after all these dates, the bubble finally shrinks, we get a big climactic battle at the end, and that's the movie. I don't have much to say about Mayuri Judgment. The whole thing obviously exists as pure fan service in the literal sense, showing off all these dates and callbacks to previous episodes and characters, but I had no idea what any of the callbacks meant and didn't pick up on any of the references, so most of it didn't land for me. What I did get from this movie was some decent enough character interactions, some visuals that looked way more like TV quality than feature film, and a plot that was basically just a wireframe to hang cute moments on top of. Oh, and the titular character only has about five minutes of screen time for some reason. Anyway, if you're a fan of Data Live, I'm absolutely sure that this will scratch that itch, and I'd actually give it a positive rating for that alone. But as a standalone movie, this is just a can watch. There's not that much going on for me here. Why are they in a crater? What the? F when did that happen? Okay. <laughs> Uh, hope we're going for flashback sequence or famous studio. So fourth spin, let's go see what we get. <laughs> you know, I'm actually surprised because <laughs> I've been spinning this wheel a lot and uh, whenever I spin it off camera, I tend to get a lot of really weird shit, like hentai. But I've never actually gotten <laughs> a hentai in the actual video. So this 
is gonna be our first. God damn, I think this I think I'm trying to get this video sponsored too. Fuck. Oh shit. All right, well, this episode is immediately getting censored. If you want to watch the full uncensored version, head over to the Patreon. Or if you'd prefer, I actually launched memberships on my website, Lextorious.com. More on that later. Our fourth show is Hanato Hebi, or Flower and Snake. Now, I want you to think of what Flower and Snake could possibly be a euphemism for in this context, because that's exactly what the show's title means. You see, Flower and Snake was originally a Japanese pink film released in 1974, based on a novel, and this is a direct quote from Wikipedia, based on a novel by Oni Roku Don, born 1931, Japan's best-known author of sadomasochistic fiction. Yeah, it's a pretty hardcore movie. The basic plot follows a husband hiring a man to train his wife, which ends up with the trainer and the wife falling in love, the husband overcoming childhood trauma, and just a lot of fucked up shit happening. But all this led to the movie becoming very famous and influential, single-handedly saving its production company, Nakatsu, from bankruptcy, and leading to the main actress, Naomi Tani, going on to win two Japanese Academy Awards. Though, Tani was already a living legend when it came to pink film actresses at the time. In fact, the only reason Flower and Snake even got made is because Nakatsu wanted Tani to act in one of their films, and she demanded it be an Oniroku Don novel adaptation, which she then fought to make as faithful as possible, despite the screenwriter arguing that it would be, quote, unfilmable. Anyways, the pink film was a massive success, and even though Nakatsu went bankrupt anyways in 1993, Toei of all companies bought the rights, and put out a remake and three sequels from 2004 to 2010, including Flower and Snake Zero in 2014, which is a goddamn prequel movie. <laughs> Meanwhile, the aerogay company Elf was tasked with making a Flower and Snake visual novel in 2005 which, for whatever reason, became the inspiration that Pink Pineapple used to create Flower and Snake the Animation in 2006, which is what I am watching today. That is a lot, but it's also very important and interesting. Way more interesting than the actual animation, let me tell you, because the Aroge game and the subsequent hentai are not only way more tame than the original movies and novel, but basically a completely different, less interesting story. Let me take you through it. Chapter 1, Beautiful But Cruel Flower This might actually be art. I might actually get a good show out of this. This might actually be something more than smut. <laughs> the show opens with a young girl hooking up with a man at a love hotel. You're not going to see any visuals on screen on YouTube, by the way, and maybe not even on Patreon because this is an uncensored hentai and it just kind of looks gross. The young girl turns out to have been hooking up with a taken man whose girlfriend and a gang of thugs pull up in a van and kidnap her. The girl's mother, our main character Shizuku, goes to a detective for help, but just gets immediately kidnapped as well. And both girls are taken to a secret hideout where some really bad stuff happens to them. The only plot-related event that happens from that point on being that Shizuko is told she'll have to perform a stage play for the safety of her daughter. She does so, but the captors just keep the daughter anyway, and in fact her situation gets much worse overall, because over three episodes both girls are just subjected to cruel and unusual punishment for basically no other reason than these guys are just really into that, until the final scene of the final episode has them basically lose their minds. There's also this whole plot about how Shizuku's husband is a wealthy businessman, and the CEO of a rival company is the one who organized the kidnappings, and this whole stage play thing. Which kinda conflicts with the whole Love Hotel opening, but honestly none of that matters, and it's just there to add a very loose connection to the original story, and sort of keep that NTR tag in there. <laughs> it's him again. <laughs> I fucking love this guy. Ah, uh, ah. Oh. Uh, oh. Okay. All in all, Flower and Snake the animation has nothing going for it, in my opinion. The plot is super weak, where the whole setup for this elaborate system of torture just seems really basic and yet takes up a surprising amount of screen time. 
Shizuku and her daughter are also complete non-characters. In the original novel and movie, Shizuku ends up having a more active role, where she basically turns the tables on her husband at the end. Also, the daughter just didn't exist. She was completely made up for the visual novel. Yet here, both of them are basically just planks of wood who are mildly upset the entire time. They don't actually do that much, aside from a failed breakout in episode 2. They just voice their complaints and then do whatever the bad guys want immediately. Which makes almost every scene incredibly boring. What makes it more boring, though, is the god-awful sound design of this show. Jesus Christ. The voice acting for the main characters is fine, but all the supporting cast is just amateurs. And you're gonna be nitpicking their performance because there is zero music 99% of the time. It's just silence and awkward voice acting and the occasional sound of, like, a Foley artist squishing a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> the animation is also super dated and ugly to me. The uncensored parts in particular are super unappealing and weird looking. Honestly, just overall as an adult film, I don't even know what you'd get from this. The original novel is at least like a hardcore freak pervert thing, which I can understand, but this has basically nothing in it that I'd even consider that over the top. It's just kind of lame and weird and awkward the entire time. So despite the cool history of this show, I'm giving it my strongest don't watch yet. Even if you're really into this genre of animation, I just don't think you're going to get anything out of this. Now, as for what space to fill out on the bingo card, I was actually very close to putting Famous Studio because this was a Pink Pineapple production, and Pink Pineapple is like one of the biggest names in the industry. However, Pink Pineapple only produced it, and a small studio called Samomo Film animated it, so it's not applicable. Though, thankfully for me, by a stroke of pure luck, this show has an in-media res opening that then flashes back to show you how our protagonist got herself in this situation. Wait, is this a wait, is this a flashback? Yes! Flashback sequence. Holy shit, I needed that. Oh my god. Which means I can nail four in a row on the card, leaving me one space away from a bingo. One space that I could have easily filled out by Maho Senso, by the way, but I didn't. So let's spin again. What the fuck are these lip flaps, dude? What? Another flashback. Let's go. <laughs> Alright, so I feel like I kind of screwed myself by not picking Famous Studio when I had the chance with Maho Senso because it was Madhouse and that would have counted and I would be done by now. But for some stupid reason, I decided to pick Magic because it's, it's literally called Magical Warfare. Uh, so I have one more show that I have to finish. <sighs> this is spin number five, I believe. Uh, hopefully it's a famous studio, otherwise I'm gonna feel a lot of regret. <sighs> Kai Dan Restaurant. <laughs> Our fifth, and spoiler alert, final show is Kai Dan Restaurant. Final, because this was animated by motherfucking Toei motherfucking animation. It literally does not get more famous than that. Cross it off the list, we did it, bingo. So Kaidan Restaurant, or Thriller Restaurant, was produced in 2009 by Toei, and was an adaptation of a series of children's books first published in 1996. Both the books and the anime being an anthology series which features a collection of short ghost stories for kids, similar to something like Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. And honestly, there's not much else to talk about with the production here. This show was incredibly popular in Japan, constantly hitting the top 10 in ratings for anime shows in 2009 and 10, and it's kept up some relative popularity over the years. So let's talk about it. Grim Reaper General Hospital. <laughs> Who the fuck would ever go there? The basic premise of the anthology series is that there is this titular Kaidan restaurant, a sort of literal ghost kitchen owned by this cute little bow tie fella called the Ghastly Garçon. And every episode, the Garçon intros several short horror stories by presenting them as different dishes. So every episode has an appetizer, main course, and dessert. The appetizer follows this group of kids at a local school who are investigating the paranormal activity of their town. 
usually encountering something supernatural every episode. The main course is a longer story that sometimes follows the kids, but is sometimes just its own standalone thing, usually with a twist at the end. And then the dessert is a folktale that the kids tell each other over candlelight, which almost always ends off with a moral lesson and some freakish lasting imagery. And I'll say right now, even though this show is made for kids, the ghost stories here are solid. There's some genuinely freaky stuff, if obviously still kid friendly, and the supernatural elements are pretty cool, especially with this trio of kids going around and kind of solving mysteries. There's obviously a lot of shows you could compare this to. However, here in Canada, we had a show called Martin Mystery, which followed a group of teenagers going around hunting cryptids and shit. And for whatever reason, the trio of kids in this show reminded me of that show a lot. Though the regular ghost stories and overall presentation are obviously pretty close to Tales from the Crypt. To highlight a couple good stories from the show, the appetizer for episode 3, titled Goodbye, follows a kid named Michio who is participating in a Go tournament at school. He's running late for the tournament though, so he runs through a busy intersection and past a crowd gathering around an accident. At the tournament, Michio plays his heart out, though people around him start to notice that he's very pale, and that his hand looks like it's starting to go transparent. While advancing up the bracket, Michio even starts to flicker in and out for a second. Though he keeps playing and gets to the final match, which is a lifelong dream of his. However, during that match, a news report comes on the TV that shows Michio actually died in that intersection after being hit by a truck. This freaks everyone out, but Michio wants to keep playing, and so he and his opponent finish the final match where Michio wins and becomes the champion. He takes a deep breath, says he's finally number one, and his spirit moves on to the afterlife. Meanwhile, the dessert for episode 2, titled Become a Flounder, follows a girl named Midori, who finds a cursed doll. She uses it to curse her classmate, a girl that sits next to her and always look at her notes, and the next day the classmate is turned into a flounder at Midori's dad's sushi restaurant. Midori goes in to help her dad one day, and stumbles upon the flounder, who curses her right back. Then the final shot is the father grabbing his knife and getting to work, preparing both fish into sashimi. <gasps> That's awesome! That is so sick, I love that. Now, I like the first story because it's a genuinely emotional little tale. Someone achieving their goal before finally moving on is kind of bittersweet. However, the second story is here entirely because if I saw that when I was 10, it would have freaked me the fuck out. Like the daughter crying out and being unable to tell her dad she's a fish. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I saw that as a kid. So overall, with 23 episodes that are all less than 20 minutes long, Kaidan Restaurant is very solid. It's a super easy watch just because of how quick it is, the stories are all decent, the animation and production is good, it does have one of the hardest EDs I have ever heard in my life, which I should mention. I'm giving this a strong should watch. Go check it out. And that is it for this episode of the Random Anime Review. I'm kind of surprised how quickly I got a bingo on this card, though I guess that is what I get for making it so broad in general. Maybe next time I'll go a little more difficult and see what happens. Now, I know right at the end here, this is where I'd normally spin the viewer recommendation wheel and pick an anime suggested from the YouTube comments to cap things off. However, I forgot. <laughs> So thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out the fully uncensored version, that's up on the Patreon. And here's where I'll officially announce that my website, LexTorious.com, has full channel memberships available now too. They exist as an alternative to Patreon in case that place goes downhill or you just really don't like using it. I'll be basically mirroring all the benefits of the Patreon onto the website, meaning you get ad-free videos and your name in the credits and all that good stuff. The website also has a donations page and some basic merch available if either of those are interesting to you. Really, I'd just check it out and take a look, it's pretty cool. Another new video should be coming out in a bit here. I'm really working hard to get my upload schedule back up to speed since I took almost two months off last time. So thanks again for watching, thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring the video, and I'll see you next time.